Notebook 10, The Verdun Charnel House. From the 26th of April, 1916, to the 19th of May, 1916. Part 1. Verdun, a name that barely needs an introduction. A battle that began on the 21st of February, 1916, with a German attack on the historically important French citadel of Verdun and its surrounding fortifications along the river Meuse. It raged with terrible brutality until the 18th of December 1916, almost ten months later. It has been the longest battle in human history, and one of the bloodiest. 302 days of slaughter, where close to 750,000 men were either killed or wounded. On average, close to 2,500 men were killed or wounded every day, over a hundred every hour, close to one every 35 seconds. By April 26, the battle had been raging for over two months. Louis Barthas and his comrades were a few of the untold thousands marching in northeastern France on their way to the Verdun meat grinder. We shall now return to their story. After an exhausting day of march under a strong sun, the Poilus finally reached the town of Condé en Barrois, where the company would be billeted for the time being. The march had been such that many men had fallen behind due to exhaustion. Captain Adjutant Major Croix Meireville gave the order that as soon as these men staggered into camp, they were to be dragged off to a medical inspection, and if they were not marked as sick, they would be thrown into prison. Barthas wrote that luckily, at this point in time, they had a good and decent medical officer, who passed everyone, so no one was punished. Later that evening, Barthas and a friend went to the town and bought a couple of bottles of good beer. After this, they looked for a comfortable spot where they could relax and enjoy their beers and a game of Manil, a card game of which they were both fanatical players, and they found a nice garden near the edge of the village, which looked like a great spot. They had barely been playing for five minutes when there appeared a furious captain. It turned out that they were playing cards right on the garden of the colonel's residence, near his window. The colonel was absolutely scandalized that two simple soldiers would dare do something like this, and he had them kicked out of the garden, writing down their names for future punishment. Shaken, the two poilus finished their beard and decided to go back to their billet. On the way, they went to return their empty bottles at the tavern where they had bought them, to get back a half franc for each, but were greeted by a strange sight. The tavern where they intended to return their bottles had its doors and windows closed shut, and an angry crowd surrounded the entrance. Apparently a group of local military slackers had taken over the place and were having fun inside, not letting anyone else get in under the pretext that there was no more drink. The crowd was getting angrier and angrier by the minute, and a few stones were even thrown against the closed shutters. At a moment of relative calm, Barthas approached the tavern's door to explain he was here to return his empty bottles, when suddenly everything turned into chaos. A bucket full of water fell on Barthas from one of the tavern's windows, and a stone whizzed by his ear. Some in the crowd thought he was another slacker trying to enter the tavern and have fun, while those inside thought that he was one of the crowd launching an assault against the barricaded door. The bucket full of water was like a signal, and the whole angry mob charged against the entrance. The ones inside pushed against the door, but it soon began to give in and crack. Barthas quickly scrambled out and away from the brawl. Moments later, the police was spotted approaching down the road, and both mob and the spectators dispersed immediately. Minutes later, Barthas finally reached his billet. It was late, 
so he decided to find a spot to sleep in. Soon he saw a large pile of sacks of oats. Happy of finding such a good spot, he lied down there to sleep. But as soon as all the soldiers had quieted down and the last candles were extinguished, he felt hundreds of little feet walking over him and high-pitched chattering. All along the wall, the roof beams over the ground, moving across his body and face, Hundreds of rats were rushing towards the sacks of oats to feast. Fruitlessly, Barthas tried to scare them away by turning on his flashlight and swinging it like a club. As soon as he turned it off, the rats returned in ever greater numbers. Eventually, he just left the rodents to their prize and found another spot to sleep in. He was shocked that someone could leave his oats so untended. At such a rate, in a couple of weeks, the rats would reduce the pile of oats to nothing. The following day, he asked around and received the answer from a neighbor. It turned out the oats had already been requisitioned by the army and paid for. The farmers did not care whether the oats went to feed rats or horses. If the army did not take care of them, it was its problem. That same day, Barthas also heard another story from the town. It turned out that Condé and Barrois marked the farthest point of German advance in that region in 1914. He was told that in 1914, five French cavalrymen scouting the area had been shot down on the bridge at the town's entrance. Both the town's inhabitants and soldiers fled in panic from the German advance. But one French marine decided he could make a profit. He disguised himself as a civilian, set up shop in a wine wholesaler's shop, and started selling all the stock to the Germans at incredibly discounted prices, as it was all profit for him. He sold so much that the next day there was a battle in a forest near the town, and all the men in the German unit were in such a state of intoxication that they were all either killed or fled away shamefully. The next day, the disguised marine's profiteering was discovered, and he was shot without trial. A small tragedy in the greater tragedy of the war. But let us return to the rest of the story. From the day after their arrival to the town, the Palouse had daily drills, field exercises and sports. There was also a concert by the regimental band, while on the background played the constant rhythm of artillery from Verdun. The soldiers also received mandatory showers from a container set up on a roof. The place was in open air exposed to the April winds. The ground was mud and the water for the shower came from the nearby river and was very cold. The soldiers were worried about getting ill, but they had no say in the matter. And Captain Adjutant Major Crow Mayreville walked along the line, inspecting and making sure every last Palou had his freezing shower. Later, on May 3rd, they had to leave Condé en Barrois and make their way to a town 12 kilometers away, where they would have to take place in a special ceremony where General Henri Philippe Pétain would receive the award of the Grand Croix de la Légion d'Honneur from the French commander-in-chief Joseph Joffre himself. Barthes's entire division was sent there. Despite the grandeur of the ceremony, not a single local inhabitant attended. As for them, it was far more important to work on their fields. The whole thing was a long, uncomfortable affair. Barthes wrote that being in the front rank, he saw Joffre march by, and he was not particularly impressed by him. There was also a parade, in which Barthes' own battalion had a particularly atrocious performance, though Joffre pretended not to see it. He also wrote that, after the ceremony ended, Joffre, Pétain, and the other high-ranked officials got onto their automobiles and left, probably to more privately celebrate Pétain's Grand Croix that had been won at the cost of the blood of thousands. Meanwhile, under a scorching sun, the Palouse made the long 12-kilometer march back to their billet for the meager meal that awaited them there. 
Two days later, on May 5th, the perpetual cannonade they could always hear coming from Verdun grew in ferociousness. It turned out the Germans had attacked and taken Hill 304, which had been held by a French division from the army corps to which Barthas belonged. At six in the evening, the Poilus were eating when they received the dreaded news. The whole division would go up to the battlefield of Verdun towards Hill 304. An hour later, they climbed onto trucks and went off towards the hellish battle in the dark of night. The truck drivers would not risk themselves, and so, at the first signs of light, they dropped the Poilus off near a town over 30 kilometers away from their objective. They would have to march the rest of the way. Exhausted and half asleep, the Poilus made their way through the muddy road until eventually they were ordered to stop at the little town of Joubecourt. They discovered that the town had suffered a catastrophe five days earlier. In the middle of the night, a German air squadron had attacked and dropped bombs on the village, demolishing houses and starting fires. The village was taken completely by surprise. An oncom and a private had tried to run away through the fields, but the airplanes cut them down with their machine guns. All in all, there had been around a hundred wounded in that attack, of which thirty had died. Now the village still showed its demolished and burned houses. Many villagers had already fled, and the ones that remained were completely terrified. As the Poilus entered Chubacourt, a heavy rain started falling. They received news that two regiments, the 114th and the 125th, were ahead of them with orders of retaking Hill 304. The Poilus would have to wait for orders to go forward and support those regiments. By 8 p.m. this order had not yet arrived, so they were allowed to go to sleep. Finding no other spot, Bartha settled down rather uncomfortably on the corner of a stable, right next to a bad-tempered mare nursing her young colt. The angry horse kicked Bartha several times and almost dislocated his knee, but after he gave her a few pieces of bread, an armistice between Poilu and horse was signed, and he managed to sleep peacefully. Another soldier approached the horse without offering bread and was kicked in the ribs, breaking them. The man had to be evacuated, but he did not regret it. He was quite happy about getting out of the war. When morning arrived, the rain stopped, and so they left the village of Joubecourt. Eight kilometers later, they stopped and set up camp in the Saint-Pierre woods. The day passed. At night, they were taking shelter from a terrible thunderstorm under improvised shelters made of a few tent cloths and tree branches when the order came to immediately head out. It was complete chaos as the men tried to prepare their things to leave in the darkness under the thunderstorm. Several fell behind, but they were not punished as they eventually managed to rejoin the regiment just in time. They left the woods and had to make their slow way through the road that had become chaos. Unending lines of artillery batteries, wagons and motor vehicles of all sorts clogged the road. It took them all night to cover eight kilometers. Then they were ordered to stop at another forest. Again they had to spend the whole day there until at night they were abruptly ordered to leave they would make camp in the reserve positions in the town of Bethelanville. The town was partially demolished, and all its inhabitants had run away, with the exception of one old man who could not force himself to leave and die far away from the church tower of the village where he had been born. Not caring about the fact that at the moment the town was being bombarded, the soldiers made themselves comfortable in the abandoned barns, where they rested well. But Barthas wrote that for the last couple of days he had been suffering terrible pains in his stomach. He tried going to the medical officer, but was only given two opium pills and told not to return. 
During those days, their superiors spread rumors that the Poilus would not be sent to Verdun, saying that they would be relieved soon and would simply receive extra rations. But these were all lies. On May 11th, their battalion was ordered to go up to the front line. Each man was given 250 rounds of ammunition, grenades, extra rations, flares and tools, among many other things. Barthas was still very ill, and his comrades lightened his load as they could. But still, he almost collapsed several times and eventually had to get rid of all the grenades, tools, ammunition and food. Luckily, Captain Adjutant Major Cromeyreville did not notice it. They passed two completely demolished villages and, at 11 p.m., finally stopped at a trench at the foot of Hill 304. They were now in the battlefield of Verdun. All night long, planks, sheets of metal and branches were brought up to their position. These were to camouflage and hide themselves from the German airplanes which flew during the day and spotted for the German artillery. Fifty meters away from their trench, there was a lonely windmill with its walls full of holes caused by shell fire, yet still somehow standing. This was where the Poilus would refill their canteens. With the first rays of light, Barthas managed to look at the infamous Hill 304. Nothing distinguished it from neighboring hills, yet both sides had fought brutally for it, and now it was home to thousands of broken corpses. Once it might have had trees, but now no trace of vegetation remained. The land had been broken and scoured a dozen times over by shellfire. It was an image of complete devastation. The Poilus had to spend the whole day huddled close to the ground and under their camouflage to escape from the airplanes that stalked the sky. It was hot and they lacked air, but fortunately it seemed they were not spotted, as no bombardment fell on them. When night came, they received the order to move by squads to a trench around 200 meters ahead of them. Here the ground had been far more heavily bombarded, making the journey more difficult. Dispatches and newspapers had given accounts of how the 114th and 125th regiments had made a heroic and unstoppable charge that routed the Germans and retook parts of Hill 304. But Barthas wrote that in truth what had happened was that the French artillery bombed the Germans with a monstrous amount of projectiles and the two regiments simply advanced and reoccupied their positions, which the Germans had abandoned so as not to be wiped out by the bombardment. Still, the two regiments had suffered significant casualties from the German artillery. All that had been achieved was a return to the previous situation. Each side controlled one side of the hill, while the hilltop itself was a no-man's land, constantly scoured by both artilleries. At the top there was one German stronghold which an Algerian division had failed to take. As Barthas' 296th regiment arrived, both the 114th and 125th regiments made room and pulled back to the rear for rest. The 296th would have to consolidate and fortify the French positions. At the entrance of the trench where Barthas and his comrades had to install themselves, there was a broken sign which read, Raska's Trench. This communication trench in reality was little more than a ditch that had been dug in a night by soldiers from the 125th Regiment and who were wiped out by shell fire the following day. Now the trench was full of shredded flesh and broken equipment. At certain spots blood had pooled and soaked into the earth and swarms of flies circled around them. The corpses were buried under dirt in shell holes and hidden from sight but they were easy to locate due to the smell of rotting flesh. Everywhere there was debris, shredded packs, twisted rifles, broken canteens, souvenirs and letters which were now scattered in the wind. 
to see that they had to occupy this grave did little to encourage the soldiers. At least Barthas managed to easily replenish all the food and gear he'd had to throw away on their march to the front. The Poilus spent the whole night digging and preparing the trench. When they came, the soldiers were overjoyed to see that there were low clouds that covered the hill and hid them from the enemy planes. During the day, the Germans sporadically fired salvos of shells, but taking shelter in the deepest parts of the trench, the Poilus did not have any wounded. When night came, Barthes' battalion was sent forward to occupy the firing line. In the darkness, they had to follow the bloody Raska's trench. Its state worsened and worsened as they went farther on. Eventually, they were made to stop and wait without explanation in a part of the trench that was little more than mud and was collapsed at several places. The Poilus had to crouch down so as not to catch a stray bullet or shell fragment. Soon after they stopped, a heavy rain fell and the place turned into a sewer. They had to wait for a long time before finally being ordered to advance. Soon the trench disappeared and gave way to barbed wire, corpses, piles of shredded sandbags and other debris. In the pitch black darkness some men got lost or entangled in the wire. The company split up. One section stayed behind as honor guard for Commandant Kansgram and Captain Crow Mayreville. Two others were sent to reinforce companies on the firing line, and Barthes' section was sent to observe on a slope of Hill 304 that faced another similarly sinister and contested hill, the Mortom, Dead Man's Hill. Barthes wrote that everything in Hill 304 was horrible, but somehow the spot where his section was sent to was even worse. They were right at the edge of a ravine between Hill 304 and the Mortom, at the bottom of which both French and German artilleries fired non-stop with shells of all calibers. So the whole place erupted and roared non-stop like a volcano. The section's mission there consisted of maintaining communication with the forces that held the facing slopes of Hill 304 and the Mortom. But Barthas wrote that after three days, all patrols ceased and only took place in fictional reports, as there was no one available to send out on patrol. The morning after arriving there and under the protection of the morning fog, Barthas went out to explore the vicinity of their new positions. At one spot he found the body of a soldier in a shell hole, completely covered in mud. Barthas touched the apparent corpse with his foot and was surprised when it protested. Just leave me alone, the man said, and Barthas recognized him as Edouard Durand, a fellow Periosa from the same section as Barthas. Barthas asked the exhausted Durand what had happened, and was told that while marching he had gotten all tangled up in barbed wire. It took Durand a lot of effort until nightfall to finally free himself, and then he could not find the section as it had disappeared in the darkness. He walked for hours until finally rejoining his squad at daybreak. Now, completely exhausted, Durand did not move. Barthas begged the man that he get up from the flooded ground and move a bit, but the man simply replied that one way of dying was just as good as another. He was deaf to Barthas's pleas, and in the end Barthas had to leave him there in his shell hole and Barthas never saw him again. That same day, half of the section departed for some unknown objective, and with that, Barthas and his comrades were completely alone. Thirty men, with their sub-lieutenant Loriot, left to cover a gap of several hundred meters of broken trenches. They were supposed to have the support of a machine gun section that was installed in a dugout nearby, but... One morning, they discovered to their horror that during the night, shelling had collapsed the entire dugout, and the whole machine gun section had disappeared under it. In that torn and undermanned landscape, the whole firing line was broken, with gaps as large as 400 meters between sections and companies. 
Some parts of the trench were bombarded non-stop, and so no one could approach them. They did not even know who occupied the positions in front of them, whether Frenchmen or Germans. To try and solve this problem during the evening, the sub-lieutenant ordered a sergeant called Fonte to take a brave man and go out in the night to scout the area ahead of them and see if it was occupied by the French or the Germans. But Sergeant Fonte could not find a single volunteer. No one wished to risk themselves so much, and everyone gave an excuse, be it weakness, exhaustion, or illness. Finally, the sergeant turned to Barthas, the corporal who had been broken in rank for his socialist ideas and pacifism, and asked him if he would join him. Barthas wrote that Fonte spoke to him not as a superior, but as a comrade and friend, so he accepted though not before demanding that for carrying out this mission he be excused from three nights of outpost duty, patrols, and work details. These conditions were accepted, and so, with nothing more than a rifle, a bayonet, and two cartridge packs each, the two of them plunged into the unknown, with only the moonlight to guide them. The land was broken and overturned as if a monstrous earthquake had devastated it, and there was no sign of any living thing. After slowly making their way over two hundred meters of this empty land, the two of them suddenly found themselves lost. They could not figure out which way was forward and which way was the way back to their half-section's position. At that moment, they heard voices approaching them, and it was impossible to make out whether they were French or German. The two of them stood still, and listened anxiously. But soon they started making out several loud curses and exclamations that could only come from those born in southwestern France. Then Barthas and the sergeant went out and discovered that it was a French ration detail from the 21st company, Barthas's old company. The man gave them the good news that about two or three hundred meters ahead of them was a segment of the French front line, held by scattered remnants of the 22nd Company. Barthas then asked the rationers if there had been any losses in the 21st Company during that day, and the news were very bad. A barber, a sergeant, and a few others had already been killed during the day. In addition, among these losses was one that affected Barthas deeply. In his former section, three of his old friends, Corporal Peire, Corporal Lash and Private Courtoli had decided to play a game of Manil, despite not finding a fourth player. They were just finishing dealing the cards when a 105mm shell fell right in the middle of their game, killing them immediately. Only Corporal Lash managed to scream before dying. Barthas wrote that, if he'd still been there with them, in all likelihood he would have been the fourth player, and would have been blown to pieces together with his friends. He wrote that every time he thought about it, it chilled him. Still, there was no time to mourn at that moment. Barthas and the sergeant made their way through the broken ground until they finally reached the forward French positions. This front-line trench was little more than a twisting corridor that communicated several shell holes. Some men were hard at work digging and expanding the trench, while others were slumped against the slope, sleeping with their rifles in their hands. Everyone was silent. Right as Varthas and the sergeant arrived, bullets whistled around them, and a man cried out before dying. These bullets had been fired by a machine gun from the slopes of the Morton, and one of them had shattered the man's skull. Barthas and Sergeant Fonte moved on, and finally found Lieutenant Courtier, who was commanding this part of the front line from a shell hole half covered with only a wooden plank. The lieutenant countersigned the reconnaissance order Barthas and the Sergeant had received, allowing them to finally return to their half section. It was 9 p.m., and the two of them had barely returned to their piece of trench when uncountable bursts of machine gun fire started showering Hill 304. 
The hellish firing did not stop, but their piece of trench did not receive as much lead as the others. So Barthas, completely exhausted, fell asleep while the machine guns of Verdun kept firing. And so we reach the end of this part of the tenth notebook. What the Palus had dreaded so much has come. They are now fighting in Verdun on the slopes of Hill 304. But perhaps fighting is not the most appropriate word, for in this terrible war to fight often means to have to stay for days in broken, corpse-filled trenches while being attacked from all possible sides with artillery, machine guns, mines, rifles and airplanes, above and below instruments of murder work to try and take as many lives as possible. But it has barely begun. Barthas and his comrades have only just arrived at Verdun, and there are still long days of suffering and death ahead of them. We shall continue with their story in the next episode, and until then, I hope you all stay well and safe.